Well, a part of God's ways is faith. He's a faith God. That's how he personally functions and operates. The Bible said we understand that the worlds, that by faith the worlds were framed. God created everything that is seen and unseen by faith. And then also, uh, and this shouldn't be surprising to us, if that's how he functions, he said, be imitators of me as dear children. And he went on to say, it's impossible to please him without the faith, the same kind of faith that he has and functions and operates in. I've got the victory living inside of me. I got the great war. I can't overcome. This ain't no time to turn back. No place to go back. I gotta keep pressing on till every battle is won. Good morning, class. Good morning, Brother Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Moore, and we welcome you to Faith School. Faith School is the place where my spirit is fed, where my faith grows stronger, and where I learn how to be an overcomer. You know, the Bible compares uh, the, the spirit man, the inner man, to the outer man and talks about how that just like the outer man needs to be fed and exercised, the inner man must be fed and exercised. And Jesus said, uh, a man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So what natural food is to your uh, physical body, the word of God is to your spirit. And uh, sadly, many people, even many church going people, they're very, very weak spiritually. And um, uh, the problem with it, 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 that shows up in that the weaker you are uh, spiritually, the bigger every problem seems to you. Uh, you could have actually a pretty small problem, but when you're really weak in the spirit, it just overwhelms you. It's just everything seems impossible. Everything seems too hard. And it's not because it's so big or so hard, it's because the person is so weak. And the stronger you get, and when I say stronger in spirit, I'm talking about stronger in faith, stronger in faith in God, stronger in God, your focus is more on Him. As you get stronger, what used to seem unreachable seems entirely doable. What used to seem impossible, you think, well, yeah, God can do that, <laughs> right? Yes. And it's not that the situation changed, you changed. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you didn't do it by yourself. The Lord helped you, but you've got to, in many cases, uh, cooperate with him in that he's not going to force you. He's not going to force feed you. I'll put it like that. <clears throat> He's not going to force down you his word and make you listen to it, make you think about it, make you confess it. And so if you're joining us, you're a smart cookie because <laughs> this is going to help you. It's going to help all of us. We're going to feed our spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Gonna let the Holy Spirit feed us and help us and it will it changes you in every area. It's, it's amazing. Now, and it's not all obvious by the end of the afternoon, but if you keep doing this over a period of days and weeks and months, you become a different person. Hallelujah. You start looking like, sounding like, acting like the overcomer God made you to be. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I am, I am. an overcomer, overcomer. In, Christ. in Christ. I'm more than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. The, greater one, the greater one, the mighty one, the mighty one lives, inside lives inside of me and gives me, and the, gives victory. me the victory. Hallelujah. 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 That's what the Bible said. This is the victory 
that overcomes the world. That's anything in the world, even our, my, your faith. Let's pray and release faith for just what we need today. Father, we're so thankful. We're so appreciative of all you've done for us thus far. You have brought us and spared us and restored us and healed us and helped us and met our needs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All of us together and everybody joining us, watching all over the world, uh, we ask you for utterance. We ask you for the anointing. We ask you for the light, the truth, the grace, the help that only you can give answers for today, for now, for us. And we purpose not to be forgetful hearers, hearers only, but to be, by your help, doers of your word and to see the results thereof. Because as surely as we act on what you say, you will always watch over it and perform it and bring it to pass in our life because you are the faithful God who never and cannot fail. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you turn in the scripture today in our great textbook, the Bible, to Hebrews, the, um, the third chapter. We've been for some time on a series that we're calling Overcoming Unbelief. And we're actually nearing the end of this series. We've been on it for some time. And if you have, you're just now joining us, I encourage you to go online to faithschool.org and go back to the beginning of the series at some point because we're building on what went before. And there's been a whole lot that's gone before. In Hebrews 3, and you'll find this is not just one instance, there are multiple places that talk about what he's talking about here. Hebrews 3, 7, he said, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Uh, a lot of Christians today uh, are really making a mistake by ignoring the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. There's no such thing as an old, out-of-date Word of God. No such thing. Everything God has ever said was, is, and always will be truth and right and good. Our covenant has changed, but God hasn't changed, and truth hasn't changed, and faith hasn't changed. And you'll find if you read the New Testament, I mean, you can't go very many verses without it referring to something in the old. And the writers of the new assume you know something about the old. It's ba it, they're linked all, all through the New Testament. And we're reading the New Testament right now in Hebrews, and he's talking about the old. And when he says, He's telling us that the things that happened there are not just history, but they're completely parallel and relevant to us now. Why? Because God doesn't change, faith doesn't change, truth doesn't change. And he said, don't harden your heart. So if the Lord says, don't let this happen to you, uh, he wouldn't say it for no reason. That means there's a definite danger and possibility of this happening if you and I don't make the right choice. And you'll find there's a lot of people, uh, people who would say they're Christians even, that have hardened their heart. Over the years, they've closed off. They've got hard. And they think... You know, they imagine that God let them down or God wasn't there when they needed him or they prayed something and it didn't work or there's all kind of things. Or uh, A lot of times it's people that let them down. Maybe it was uh, ministers. Maybe it was fellow Christians or whatever that they trusted and believed in and respected and they let them down. Well, you know, just because people let you down didn't mean God let you down. 
Don't you think you ought to make the, the difference, right? Yeah. Distinguish, you know? Um, and yet people have done that. They've hardened their heart. And he said, don't let that happen to you like what they did when they uh, tempted me. Now, that's an interesting phrase. How do you tempt God? The word actually, we might translate it today in our vernacular, test. Test God. And do you think anybody ever tries to test God? All the time. All the time. Why? why? How would you do that? Well, he said they, uh, uh, they tempted me. They proved me and they saw my works 40 years. They didn't understand that it wasn't God who was being tested. It was them. It was their faith. It was their, will they obey? Will they believe? Will they trust? But they kept trying to turn it around and, and challenge God. Prove to us, where are you? When are you going to? Well, see, listen to the tone of that. You know, God, if you're real, prove it to me. You hear the word prove? Mm-hmm. Prove? That's what he's talking about. See, that indicates a hardness of heart, not a tenderness of heart. And listen to the tone. Uh, well, where are you, God? When are you going to do this? How long am I supposed to wait? What are you waiting on? See, that is utter disrespect. It is lack of honor. It is total unthankfulness. It is acting like you don't know who you're talking to. Right? Uh, He's God. And shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, (laughs) what are you doing? (laughs) Now we're laughing. But people do this all the time. Many people are attempting to test God. And uh, that's completely getting out of your place and not not operating in reality. Uh, No, he's God. He's your creator. Your next breath depends on him. Gravity depends on him. Right? Yeah. The light of our sun depends on him. Yeah. No, you, you should come before him humbly and you should make the choice, all of us should make the choice to trust him. Trust him. I'm, I'm going to make this phrase and I think we'll be coming back to it maybe throughout the week. But if you're testing God, you're not trusting God. Did you hear that? If you're testing God, you're not trusting him. Say it out loud, Lord. Lord, I choose to trust you. you. I'm not trying to test you. you. You've got nothing to prove. prove. I I have been tested. tested. And by your grace, grace, I can pass the test. And I trust you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, don't harden your hearts in the, as in the provocation when they provoked him in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. Did God enjoy them trying to test him? Was he pleased with it at all? Well, again, if you're testing him, you're not trusting him. What pleases him? Faith. Faith. And so if you're trying to test him, there's no faith involved. There's no trust involved. He said, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. This is so big. He said, and and you got to remember the proximity of these people to the, the literal, even physical manifestation of God. They saw the, the glory cloud. <laughs> they saw the burning pillar of fire. They had seen the splitting of the Red Sea. They, 
they saw the manna fall out of the sky. They saw the water come rushing out of the rocks. And even after all that, they were clueless as to who God is and what kind of being he is and what he wanted and what his ways were. They did not know him and they didn't have a heart to want to know him. Now that, that's the thing that's puzzling to some and I've heard people say and it sounds like a good phrase but you know they say well God you know is love and God is good and uh, if, if you just get to know him you'd love him and anybody that would get to know him that's not true that's not true I know it sounds good but uh, Jesus came unto his own and they saw him and heard him and they didn't want him and he said, they have both seen and hated both me and my father. He said, they hated me without a cause. He came to humanity and humanity saw him up close and personal. And, and there were some that loved him. The disciples who became apostles and many other disciples and those that followed him. But there were also many that absolutely hated him. They heard what he preached. They saw what he did and they hated him. So that's what's going on throughout the whole earth is that people are getting glimpses of God. You see God in creation itself. Yes. You see God when you look up in the night sky. But that doesn't mean you love him because you see it. We can't make the choice for everybody else. But how many of you would say, I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to understand and know his ways. I want to find out what he wants, what he likes, what pleases him. And that's what I want to do. I want to, you know, Jesus said, I, I do always those things that please him. From the time Jesus got up in the morning to the time he laid down at night, everything he said and did pleased the Father. He's our example, yes. right? Yes. He was and is the ultimate father pleaser. Said out loud, by the grace of God, the grace of God I, will I will please God. Please God. You can. We can. He said, uh, I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart. They have not known my ways. Well, a part of God's ways is faith. He's a faith God. That's how he personally functions and operates. The Bible said we understand that the worlds, that by faith the worlds were framed. God created everything that is seen and unseen by faith. He's a faith God. Come on, somebody said out loud, he's a faith God. He's a faith God. He's a fa so we're talking about learning his ways. Well, part of his ways is how he functions, how he does things. And then also, uh, it shouldn't be surprising to us, if that's how he functions, he said, be imitators of me Amen. as dear children. And he went on to say, it's impossible to please him without the faith, the same kind of faith that he has and functions and operates in. And that's why we have faith school. That's why we spend so much time on this is because you learn about real faith. You learn about God, Amen. not religious ideas of God, but you learn about the actual one true living God. Say it out loud again. He is, he is a faith God. A faith God. Now say this out loud, I am, I am a, faith a faith child of a faith God. Of a faith God. Hallelujah, that's, Hallelujah. That, that's how we live, that's how we walk, that's how we receive, that's how we resist, that's how we overcome, that's how we have victory, that's how we please God. Amen. So people that mock faith and people like us, they're mocking pleasing God. They're not thinking right. We all are those faith people. They say it like it's a bad word. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody years ago thought they were trying to uh, insult me. They said, well, you're just trying to act just like Jesus. 
I thought that was the idea, right? You got somebody better I can act like? (laughs) No, that's the whole idea is that we uh, operate in the same way our father does. He's a faith God. He said, they didn't, they haven't known my ways. And so I swear in my wrath, they'll not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief robbed them. And he's saying, don't let it rob you. And he's, he called here unbelief evil. Evil. Uh, we don't use the word evil as much in modern vernacular as we use the word bad. That's a comparable word. But unbelief is bad. It is inherently, intrinsically evil and bad. I say that because a lot of people think, well, it's just, yeah, we all have some unbelief. It's no big deal. You know, we're, we're getting a little better. No, it's bad stuff. You don't want to make any allowances for it. You don't want to make any excuses for it. And the thing is, you and I never have to doubt God. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes. We never have to. Now, we have. We've, all of us have made mistakes. Thank God you can repent and receive forgiveness. The Lord won't hold it against you. But uh, believing and trusting is a choice. It's a decision. And so if you doubted, if you yielded to unbelief, you made the wrong choice. When you could have made the right one. Are y'all with me, class? Yes. So uh, that's what he's saying. It, it's an it's a evil choice. It's a bad choice. Evil unbelief. And it's something that really displeases God. In studying these cases that we've studied there with, uh, with the Israelites that God brought out of Egyptian bondage, case after case, there's some 15 incidents that are recorded where they made the wrong choice. And they chose not to trust. They chose to doubt. They chose to test God and provoked him. And it, over months and years, I mean, it angered him. It, it, it wearied him. It, you know, he was very displeased with them. I don't want to do that. How about you? And how many know God's not unreasonable? If they couldn't help it, he wouldn't have been that way about it. But it was something they could have changed at any time. Not that they couldn't change, they wouldn't change. Mm -hmm. And so he said, uh, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we're made partakers of Christ if... We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. He said, what, about three or four times in the last several verses, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. He goes on to say, For some, when they had heard, did provoke Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. What kept them out? Not the giants, not the walled cities. Not their lack of military training or ability. None of those things. It was unbelief. See, many times people think they've got a a money problem. They've got this or that problem. But it's actually an unbelief problem. Because if God could fix the money problem, right? If you you could get in faith, then it's not really a money problem. Can you all see this class? And that's true in area after area. It goes on to say in the fourth chapter, let us therefore fear. See, he's talking about how all this applies to us. 
lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You know, when you hear the gospel, gospel means good news. When you hear the good news, the good reports, the good things that God is saying, your response shows whether you believe it or not. Hmm? When the, if the Lord says, I'm with you, I, I'll cause you to triumph always. Hallelujah. I give you the victory. And if you hear that and you go, uh, yeah, but it's just so hard. God, see, you don't believe it. You don't believe it. You don't believe what he said. And so even though he gave you good news and you heard the good news, it's missing a component. Huh? Notice what he said. He said uh, the, the word preached to them didn't profit them. It didn't benefit them. Why? It was missing an activator. <laughs> right? It was missing a component. Amen. Maybe you learned in chemistry class that there were certain elements. If you kept, kept it separate in this test tube and this test tube, nothing happening. But if you mixed them, if you put a little of this in that, whoo, all kind of activity. Well, that's exactly what happens with the Word of God and faith. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. And it's why people have thought, well, I was in that meeting. I didn't get anything out of it. Well, you're just telling off on yourself. You refuse to put any activator right, right. with it, right? I mean, it's, it's possible to two people be in the same service, two people watch the same faith school message, and one, people, one person get all excited and go out and receive and have a miracle, and the other person leave bored. Why? Same word. One had faith, mixed in. Other, no mixture. And our time is out. <laughs> Everybody said out loud, I live by faith. I walk by faith. I overcome the world by faith. I'm strong in faith, giving glory to God. We'll see you next time here in Faith School. I've got the victory living inside. Thank you for joining us at Faith School. Class is dismissed for today, but you can watch this and other episodes of Faith School free of charge at faithschool.org. For more information, visit our website or call us at 941-702-7390.